Kneel before Zor! You can't go! All the plants are gonna die! I'm gonna take a bath. Bad dates. I'll alert the media. Boys, keep off the moors. It's evil! Don't touch it! The name's Pliskin. No! Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in chronological order, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today we're discussing Cutter's Way, released March 20th, 1981. It was written by Jeffrey Allen Fiskin, based on a novel by Newton Thornburg, directed by Yvonne Passer, and released by United Artists. Uh, I think it's, it's Ivan. It's Yvonne. Is it? Yeah. Oh. It, well, that's the way John Hurd pronounces it in an interview that I heard. But it's a dude, right? Yeah. Okay. Why? Why did you say? Just because of the spelling. Oh, okay. No, he's um, this he's a, Czech. Okay. And so he pronounces th- it Ivan. This is like a Dana Elkar kind yeah. of situation. In 1976, author Newton Thornburg's novel *Cutter and Bone* was published. The same year, it was announced that To Kill a Mockingbird director Robert Mulligan and On Golden Pond director Mark Rydell were both slated to direct the film before final director Yvonne Passer. The film had a very limited release under the original book title, Cutter and Bone, and it didn't make a lot of money, but the critical praise led to a wider release under the new title, Cutter's Way. John Hurd's Heartbeat co-star Nick Nolte and Tommy Lee Jones were both considered for the part of Cutter. Dustin Hoffman was briefly attached to the film in that role. Tom Berenger fought really hard for it and was repeatedly turned down. For which role? For Cutter. I okay. feel like I would have liked most of those better. I don't know about Tom Berenger, but I like uh, I like all of those guys better. I think so. The studio wanted Richard Dreyfuss as Cutter, which I actually think would have been the best choice. I think that, yeah, I think that would have been a fine choice. But director Passer insisted on John Hurd and agreed to Jeff Bridges to play Bone as a compromise with producers. Yvonne Passer. <laughs> I like that, though. Jeff Bridges is so great, it makes up for John Hurd. Yeah, that's what, that's what the studio was basically like. He's he's a name. I mean, he's multi generational name in Hollywood, and people like him. There's it's there's money in that name. Yeah. Yvonne Passer and producer Paul Gurian met with Jeff Bridges personally to offer him the role, but while on Bridges' property, Gurian was attacked by Bridges' German Shepherd and nearly died. Oh my God! Apparently, the dog bit him in the jaw and tore some stuff. Ugh. I was like, I guess I'll do your movie now. <laughs> yeah, well, Bridges accepted the role fearing that turning it down would result in a multi-million dollar lawsuit. Like, he said <laughs> that in interviews. What he didn't know is that United Artists had already stipulated that if they couldn't get Jeff Bridges to be in the film, that they would have scrapped the project entirely. When he was hired to adapt the novel to script, screenwriter Jeffrey Allen Fiskin was so poor that he had to shoplift a copy of the book. We start the film with slow-motion black-and-white footage of a parade for Old Spanish Days in Santa Barbara. Under our opening titles, the footage slowly speeds up and colorizes. One of the dancers swishes past the camera, and we rotoscope along the edge of her dress to fade to an establishing shot of a building at daytime. But then we cut immediately to the El Encanto Hotel at night, giving me the impression that we intended to start wherever this establishing shot is, right. and they liked the rotoscope so much that they didn't want to cut it, and so they cut to a different scene immediately yeah. after. Yeah, it's really weird to do two establishing shots in a row at two different times a day. Well, I was going to say, of course, we living in the area recognize this immediately as Santa Barbara. Oh, did they not say Santa Barbara at the beginning? Maybe oh, they don't. Did they? I don't, they, I don't, they, don't remember. During the festival like at stuff? At some point, I think they give us indications that it's Santa Barbara. I, I mean, they, they say it multiple times in the film. Right. But, but it's also possible that we just recognized it. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, I, I certainly recognize this building. Yeah. yeah I was going to say, just even as they're walking down the street, I'm like, oh, that's definitely Santa Barbara. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we got married like a block away from there. At the El Encanto Hotel that night, Jeff Bridges as Richard Bone is trimming his mustache in a hotel bathroom while a woman smokes in the bed behind him. He pulls up his pants and he tells her that he needs to leave to deliver medicine to a sick friend and he asks for money to pay for the medicine. She doesn't believe him, but eventually she hands over some cash anyway. Before he leaves, he asks her one last time if she's at all interested in buying a boat as he collects a pamphlet from the nightstand and she says that her husband probably wouldn't approve of that expenditure. So I was really confused by this scene because <laughs> I was like, oh, so he's a gigolo? 
Um, or because at first I thought she was a prostitute, and then I thought, oh no, he's the prostitute. Right. Okay. I was like, and then it wasn't until much later that I realized what's really going on. <laughs> he's trying to sell a boat. <laughs> he's trying. He's actually trying to sell a boat. He's giving her his dinghy. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> what? Leaving the hotel. Bone locks eyes with a blonde woman at the door who I think later in the film we will come to know as Valerie Duran, the sister of the victim of this story. Outside, he requests a green Healy from the valet, and they bring around his trashed car with a duct-taped rag top. He obviously doesn't have anything to tip the valet with, and his car grinds on down the road. Yeah, when he, when he pulled up, and he says, my engine's sounding funny. I guess that grows your tip. Right. I thought he was implying that, that they did it to the car. I mean, I yeah. think that is what he was saying just to excuse away the fact that he has no money to tip mm. him. But when you pull up in that car to give the keys back to the owner, you're not expecting a tip anyway. Probably I think. not. The car finally breaks down in a rainy alleyway and completely dies on him. The headlights turn off and everything. While he sits in the car, another vehicle pulls up behind him with its headlights on. And Bone steps out to wave the man down, who seems to be dumping something in a trash can. When the man notices him, he guns it and nearly runs Bone over. Bone shouts angry words after the man, and then turns to investigate the trash can when it starts raining harder. And Bone has angry words for God as well. Fuck you two! We get a quick insert before we leave this scene of the woman's legs sticking up out of the trash can. That's what the person was dumping right. there. But he never actually walked up to the trash can. Correct. Beca- because it started to downpour, he, right. he walked away. He was interrupted in his investigation. We cut to John Hurd's one-eyed titular character, Alex Cutter. He's in a bar at 1.30 a.m. drinking and losing at cards. When Bone enters, Cutter welcomes him as the Ishmael to his Ahab. Ah, holy mateys. Ishmael returneth, huh? Hey! I'll go just search for that fiendish leviathan in the deep, Moby Dick. Oh, Moby Dick. Isn't that that a social disease? Then he introduces him to the other people seated around the table, but not with their real names. A couple are Rosencranst and Guildenstern. Another guy is Karl Marx, but I couldn't tell if that was his real name or not, because he Mm -hmm. says it like it's totally serious. Yeah. And then the last guy he calls the N-word, which causes other African-American patrons to surround the table, offended by his choice of words. Cutter laughs it off and asks what he's supposed to call African-American people, and suggests a bunch of other slurs. Bone blames Cutter's behavior on his experiences at war, and they seem to accept that as an excuse until Cutter claims that he never fought in any war. <laughs> like He's like, no, 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 I want to be in trouble here. Which he has, though. Right, he was in the Vietnam War. Right. Which is where he lost his arm, his leg, and his left eye. Yeah. All, all all lefts. Is he missing a leg or is it is it just not? No, it's a below the yeah, knee amputation. He's missing okay. his leg. Okay. He's yeah. got a, a prosthetic on though. All right. Bone steals Cutter's keys partly to ensure that he won't drive in his current drunken state and also because he just needs a car to get home. Cutter chases him to the bar door and throws his cane across the room shattering a Miller High Life neon light. But somehow getting the cane to hang on to the remaining neon sign which I thought was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that was a lucky shot. Back at their home, Bone turns on the heater and starts undressing in front of it. Cutter's wife, Maurice, or Mo, as she is affectionately known, enters the room with a bottle of liquor, and she starts drinking it on the couch. It looks like this is her second full bottle of vodka that she's chugging here on the couch. Are they actually married? Because he refers... Cutter and Mo are married, yes. Okay, he refers to her as his wife, but he he often says wifey, and I didn't know if it was just a term of affection Mm -hmm. or if they were actually married. But there is somewhat of a love triangle that's revealed here right but it seems like they've known each other for a long time these three like since childhood Mm -hmm. and that cutter and mo married before he went to vietnam and he's changed he came back different yes mo picks on bone for being home already because he's usually out having sex with older women trying to sell them boats this late at night bone seems annoyed by her but she keeps pestering him it must be tough playing second fiddle a one-eyed cripple? Yeah, he's not your average one-eyed cripple. The next day, a pair of garbage men are moving down the alley, and they find the dead woman's body and Bone's dead car. Early in the morning, George Swanson, who I thought was the bartender at that bar. But yeah, so did I. It turns out he's just a friend of theirs who Cutter must have reached out to. George is giving Cutter a ride home, and he carries him from the car to the door. Cutter is still wasted, but they manage to get him inside and drop him on the couch. There's a nice little detail here of police sirens in the background oh they're way in the background but they start getting like slightly louder because they're finding the body well i think no i think they're just on their way to pick up 
uh, bone. Oh, okay, maybe. Yeah. I, I couldn't tell how far apart these different things are supposed to be happening because it seems like a small town. Like you might have even heard them finding the, uh, you the know, woman's I mean, body. But the police show up at the end of the scene, so right. it makes sense. Swanson seems like a really nice guy. And before he steps out the door, he asks Bone how it went with the lady, if he was able to sell a boat. And Bone tells him the bad news. Cutter keeps asking people to give him a nearby liquor bottle, and when no one does, he starts swinging at it with his cane, eventually knocking it to the floor but getting a hold of it. Cutter recommends the three of them make plans for the day, and suddenly two men are knocking at the door. They're here about Bones' Healy convertible, and when he confirms that it's his, they arrest him and take him downtown for questioning. Which I think is odd, because I feel like anybody's car could be parked yeah you know in any vicinity of this body and that doesn't mean that you have any evidence whatsoever to charge this person right i would say yeah we want to question you because you might have been in the area of something that happened but he shouldn't be charged with anything at the moment yeah yeah and and the moment he explains to them his car broke down they could prove that by showing that it won't start and it's like and who would dump a body and then leave their car registered to themselves a drunk person yeah. who just killed this lady i mean i i understand why they would at least come to him and assume that he's a suspect but you're right they they probably wouldn't have the proper recourse to arrest him yeah let alone getting his picture in the paper which right. happened yeah i was like what although when i was in high school <laughs> yeah there was a teacher that was arrested for um shall we say inappropriate behavior with some students and instead of his picture in the paper, they ran the wrong teacher's picture in the oh, paper. No. Oh, no. And it was a big deal. So, and I went into that teacher's classroom first thing in the morning. I was like, hey, did you read the paper this morning? He's like, Patrick, not now. <laughs> like, Jesus. I'm dealing with it right now. He's like on the phone with his attorney. Oh, my God. It was a mess. Yeah. What an asshole of a kid to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> it's me. I, I have my own connection to that story. <laughs> Do you? Yeah. Oh, because you live down the street from the teacher. My cousin bought his house. <laughs> oh, God, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. The police share with Bone the details of the case. The victim was raped and beaten to death. She was also a 17-year-old cheerleader. Bone tells the detective for what seems like the third or fourth time that he didn't see anything other than a vague shape behind him. The detective asks his staff to send in Valerie Duran, the sister of the victim. When she enters... We see Bone apologize to her, but we don't hear any more of their conversation here. And I thought this was a weird move, too. Right. Um, because I'm for, very interested to what he would have had to say to her. Well, no, or even so, like, th- th- this is, like, a reason that you have people in, like, in a lineup behind glass with it's a mirror that you they can't see you. So they can say, hey, have you ever seen this man before? Yeah. Right. Not just bring, if he is a suspect and you, you, you believe him to be your su- primary suspect in a murder, you don't bring... Here's here's her sister who can identify you or or knows now what you look like. Yeah, that you might might have to kill her too. Yeah, it it also bothers me that all he says is I'm sorry. Granted, there might be more conversation we're not hearing. There has but, to be. But if I were him, I'd be like I'm sorry for your loss, which is what I assume he meant with the I'm sorry. Oh no. As opposed to being like I'm sorry, I murdered your sister. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Do you feel better now? Can you guys shake hands? <laughs> Later, Bone meets up with Cutter and Mo at the ongoing fairgrounds. They watch the parade pass by for a while, complimenting some of the high school girls twirling batons. Then Cutter starts to plan a heist of the precious metals in the mouths of the passing horses. Hey, look at the silver in that horse's mouth, huh? You think we can mug a horse? Hi there. You think we can mug a palomino? <laughs> <laughs> I really like that line. Suddenly, Bone recognizes someone in the parade a balding man with mirrored sunglasses riding a horse. He tells Cutter, that's the man. That's the man he saw put the girl in the trash can last night. And Cutter identifies the man as the honorary president of the parade, James J. Cord. Right away, Cutter is ecstatic to learn that this is even a possibility. And he starts celebrating that this rich guy is a murderer. They also say hi to their friend George, who is a part of the parade just a few horses behind Mr. Cord. Later in a diner, Mo reads Cutter and Bone an article about Mr. Cord's busy night. He went to an oil conference at the El Encanto Hotel, the same hotel where Bone was last night, and later that night, Cord's car went up in flames at the marina. He claims that he was checking on his boat when someone set his car on fire. 
Bone isn't ready to commit to this conspiracy. I like that you say that Bone isn't ready to commit to this conspiracy as if he will ever commit to this yeah. conspiracy. Instead, he blames the ruckus crowd at the fiesta for having set the car on fire in celebration. Late that night, Mo is watching out the window of her home when Cutter arrives. The neighbor's car is parked blocking their driveway, so Cutter backs up a bit and then smashes into it hard multiple times, driving it back into the neighbor's yard before pulling into his newly unobstructed driveway. He's drunk. <laughs> Makes you say that. Cutter is laughing hysterically about it when the neighbor comes out to start screaming at him. He invites them into his home to discuss the accident, but then hits on the guy's wife, and Bone has to get in between them to prevent a fight. Not that I'm siding with Cutter in this, but they know that he's a crazy dude that lives next door, don't park in front of his driveway. Yeah. It's not like you just moved in or you're some random person visiting parking on the street. You're his neighbor. Yeah, I, and he's also one-eyed and I would guess has a history of drunk driving. Like, there's plenty of reasons not to put your car right there. Yeah. After he stumbles back into the house, Mo asks where he's been and he claims to have been doing research picking up hitchhikers. Mo can hear the police arriving and informs Cutter that his insurance and license are both expired and Cutter says, that's fine, the car runs without a license. <laughs> when Cutter comes outside to greet the cops, he is much calmer. He claims that he knows his driveway from memory because he's missing an eye, and when he turned into the driveway, he didn't expect it to be blocked by the neighbor's car. But he's missing the wrong eye for this to be the correct excuse. Yeah, um, but also, before he heads back out to talk to the police, he rinses his mouth out with right. mouthwash. Yeah. And he's very eloquent. Yes. Like, like he's he's perfectly calm. He's very respectful clearly. to the police. Yeah. yeah. The cop asks for his license and Cutter hands it over and acts surprised to hear that it's expired, but politely invites the cop to write him a citation. The neighbor's so angry that Cutter isn't being arrested here that he starts shouting at the police and they're immediately not interested in helping him. Yeah. Like he's calling them assholes and he says he pays taxes. Yeah. Well, regardless of who's wrong in a situation, the police are always going to side with the calm person. Right. Inside later, Cutter tells Bone that there's a new disco club across the street from the El Encanto called Group Therapy. He learned about it from his hitchhiker research, and that's where Vicky Duran was last seen. Cutter says that he posed as a reporter for Sunset Magazine to find out from the PR guy at the hotel that JJ left around 11 p.m. Again, Bone doesn't consider this to be confirmation enough to pursue the case any further. The next day, he's playing tennis with George when Cutter arrives with Valerie Duran. It seems Cutter has shared with her Bones' suspicion that J.J. Cord is responsible for her sister's murder. And she is fully on board. Yeah, and he just went and found her yeah. and said, come with me, we're going to talk to my buddy who saw it all happen. Which I feel like is weird. It's a weird It's a weird thing for him to have done, but it's a weirder thing for her to go along with. Right. I don't understand her at all in this movie. Well, and she already knows that Bone knows because she met him at the police station. Right, yeah. So there's no new information for her, except that he has some suspicion of who did it after he left the police station. And that Cutter has a scheme. Right. George invites the gang to head over to a nearby French restaurant for a meal and offers to pay the bill. They all get there before him, and Cutter is talking really loud about his whole theory of what happened to Valerie's sister. He's being very graphic to the point that he's drawing looks from people at the tables around them. Valerie says that someone in a funny hat with sunglasses bought a bunch of gasoline in jugs from a gas station that night before Cord's car was set on fire. Cutter talks them through the whole theory of the night. Cord left the party drunk and saw Vicky hitchhiking and picked her up. He wanted to have sex with her, but he was too drunk to finish. And uh, she starts to laugh. And I'm old and I'm fat, I'm sweaty. And uh, she's laughing. She's laughing and she's choking and she, she spits my beauty come right in my face. Man! She ain't laughing anymore. <laughs> Cutter can't help but repeatedly puncture the story with Cord's name loud enough for people to hear it all around them. But it also bothers me how easily he seems to inhabit the Cord character from this story. And it's weird that Valerie, whose sister died like yesterday or day yeah. before yesterday, yeah. is not at all disturbed or uncomfortable. Right. Like we get plenty of reaction shots for her and she's like, yep, yeah, that's probably what she did. She probably spit his puny cum in his face. Now, <laughs> is this... Is there no sort of DNA testing 
Uh, in 80, no, I don't not, think so. Not yeah. this early. I no. mean, they could identify that it was semen. That was mm. about as far as they got. They were like, this is not yogurt. Oh, God. <laughs> 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 Give me one you of see a guy spit it into a cup. <laughs> this is not yogurt. <laughs> it's not a very. Uh... <laughs> it can only be one of two things. <laughs> I gotta fails fit. the yogurt test, guys. <laughs> the yogurt test just it goes around the office. It's your turn for the yogurt test this time, Jim. Oh, God. I did it last time. <laughs> oh no! By the way, the aftermath of the story is that Cord needs to clean his car very quickly. And he decides that because it's fiesta time and partiers are known to destroy property like that, that he'll set it on fire at the marina to avoid having to worry about it. Thus having purchased the gasoline jugs. Right. Finally, Valerie lays out their specific plan. They're going to let Cord know that they know that he did it. George finally joins them at the table, and when he hears what they've been discussing, he points out Mrs. Cord sitting at the table next to them and advises them to leave. But they don't tell him a lot of what they've said. They just tell him they've been talking about Mr. Cord. Yeah. But they don't say specifically, we've been loudly accusing him of a rape murder. As his friends leave, George steps over to Patricia Cord's table to say hello, and she asks who his friends are. George straight up gives her Richard Bone's name, canceling any element of surprise they might have had with their plan. Valerie explains the plan in even more detail later, including that they expect to collect blackmail money from JJ on the way to turning him into the police for more money. Cutter gives a long speech about his reaction to the Vietnam War, and how it was the same as everybody else's. The first one was real easy. I hate the United States of America. Yeah. You see the same damn thing the next day and you move up a notch. There is no God. Yeah. But you know what you finally say? What everybody finally says? No matter what? I'm hungry. <laughs> I'm hungry, Rich. I'm fucking starved. So you pick out somebody to blackmail him. I didn't pick him out. You did. And he isn't somebody. He's responsible. For the girl? For everything. Him and all the motherfuckers in the world just like him. They keep talking to Bone about this as if they're trying to convince him to partake in the plan, but they don't need him for any part of this plan. He already told the police everything that he knows, and they know everything that he knows, so I don't know why they're wasting their breath trying to convince him to co-write a ransom note with them, if they could just do it themselves. Well... I think I think in their eyes if not that they need his signature for confirmation right but that if the letter came from Cutter or from Valerie it wouldn't hold any credibility but right. if it came from Bone he's then the witness. he's the witness right but they could just write B- Bone at the bottom of the Correct. letter and sign it yeah but but that I don't think Cutter would put his friend at risk without him at least knowing it yeah Eventually, Bone tells them as much. But you don't need me. Do it yourself. That way you'd only have to split the money two ways. Valerie follows Bone out of the scene, and we immediately cut to them on his boat together. Like, Bone took his boat out, and he invited Valerie along on his boat. Very quickly, she starts unbuttoning her shirt and tucking his hand in over her breasts. He just stands up immediately and turns the boat around because he's not interested in a relationship with her. But this is like, I don't understand any of this character's motivations. It's like she she literally doesn't care at all about her sister, but she just found out, like, we might get money out of this. And then she's just like, I'm going to hang out with these two guys and do whatever they want to do. We're just going to have some fun. See, I didn't take that as her motivation. I took it as she's willing to do whatever it's going to take to convince him to try to get to the bottom of this. Yeah. yeah. But she, she claims here on the boat that it, that's not what it's about, that she's like, oh, we're just two people. We should be able to do what we want. Yeah, but she's saying that. Because she wants to get what she wants, which is him to agree to this so that they can find the killer of her sister. Yeah, I, I don't know. I can't, I can't read her mind at all in this movie. When they pull back into the docks, the wind is throwing the boom around like crazy and nobody's paying attention to it as they try to disembark. Valerie gets cracked in the back of the head once and Bone almost gets it right in the face. But it's weird that they're just letting this thing fly around and yeah. nobody's looking at it. George sees Bone tying the boat down and he calls him into his office to talk. It took me until this scene to notice, but Jeff Bridges looks really dirty for this whole movie. Like, I can't tell if he's supposed to be, like, tan or what, but he just looks dusty. (laughs) Like, it's an uneven tan or something on his face. It's weird. George would like to know what Cutter's up to, and it seems like he's asking on Cord's behalf. 
After George leaves the office, Bone calls Cutter and says that he's in on the letter. Listen, I changed my mind. About what? Cord. It's too late. What do you mean? I just slashed my wrist. Well, tape it. <laughs> <laughs> and see, I don't know what what occurred here to get this change of heart. Yeah, uh, other than he's like, well, that that's a little weird that Cord wants to know what Cutter's up to. Like, mm-hmm. what does that have to do with anything? Like, why would he be suspicious of things? They write a full letter to Cord claiming that they saw what he did and they want money in exchange for their silence. They put Richard Bone's name at the bottom and ask him to sign it, which seems completely backwards to me. Mo enters with huge shopping bags full of groceries. Food, huh? Yeah, I remember food. People used to have to eat it during the Prohibition, didn't they? Occasionally for days on end. Bone insists to Mo that food will never catch on. <laughs> I like that line. Cutter finally lets Mo in on their plan, and she arrives as the voice of reason in the scene. She tells them how stupid the plan is, and she seems mostly disgusted by Valerie, who is trying to win two paychecks off of her sister's body. Mo complains that Cutter doesn't hear a word she says, and compares herself to his leg, sending signals to a brain that doesn't exist. He slaps her hard across the face, and Bone gets in the way, but Mo points out that this isn't the first time, and Bone naively, but correctly, demands that this will be the last time. The three blackmailers hop in a car and drive over to J.J. Cord's building. Bone heads inside with a note while Cutter and Valerie wait in the car. Outside, Cutter and Valerie act out how they think it's going for Bone inside. Hi, I'm here to see Mr. Cord. And, uh... <laughs> You're kind of sexy. Do you have an appointment? No, no, I don't have an appointment, but uh, I have to see him. It's a matter of crucial concern to Mr. Court. Concerns the night his car was uh, burned. I'm sure he'd be very, very glad to hear from me, but it has to be from me personally. Well, I don't have that authority. I'm sorry. I'll have to go to my superior, Miss Ironcrotch. Yeah? No kidding. Well, you, uh, you know, you do what you have to do, miss. Cutter is getting very handsy with Valerie here, peeling away at her top and reaching up under her skirt, and I still think it's weird that she's being so flirty with both of these dirty creepers who might or quite possibly don't have any information on her sister's murder. Bone hops back in the car and says they've got to leave right away. Apparently, they took the letter, but as a deal, he has to call back at 1 p.m. They drive straight out to Santa Monica Pier. Do you remember the last time that we saw Santa Monica Pier? Blood Beach? Blood Beach. Yeah. (laughs) They waste time at a crappy carnival game with a fake Tommy gun, But eventually Cutter gets impatient and annoyed because the time to call is fast approaching. So he whips out a handgun and shoots the target of the game, breaking it instantly. The man running the booth hands off a giant stuffed animal to Bone, and Valerie slips the man a fat stack of cash to not say anything to anybody before they leave to make the call. She gave him like a 20. That's more than any of this was worth. You could yeah. rebuild this whole booth for $20. I'm just saying. It was was multiple bills. No, it wasn't. Yes, it was. Fine. Maybe not. I don't know. Bone calls the office, and they tell him that Cord has no interest in responding to the letter. Cutter hadn't even considered the possibility of this response, and loses his shit, smashing the phone with his cane, ripping the stuffed animal out of Valerie's hands, and then throwing it off the side of the pier before emptying the rest of his handgun into its remains. Bone admits here, for some reason, I don't know, that he didn't deliver the letter, because he's not comfortable with this going any further. So, now flashing back to when when Bone calls and says, hey, I'm in... Maybe in in Bone's mind, he thinks that if he helps with this scheme, he could sabotage it from the inside, and that'll be the end of it. Yeah. Cutter pretends to find this very amusing because he's so angry. He remembers that he can do this alone, and he says he will. He invites Bone to head back to their house so he can be lonely with Mo. At home, Bone finds Mo lounging in the backyard with a boob hanging out of her robe and stands there watching her like a creeper. Bone tells her that he chickened out, and he's not a part of the plan anymore. Just then, Cutter calls to inform them that he's delivered the letter to Cord himself, and that he forgives Bone for abandoning the mission. Bone and Mo make plans to prepare a meal together. They dance to music, and Bone starts putting the moves on her when she pushes back. She doesn't want to lose him as a friend, but Bone seems perfectly willing to lose her as a friend. She's offended by this evaluation of their friendship. I guess we really don't have that much to lose, do we? They move to the bedroom together, and Mo sobs through their entire lovemaking session. 
Bone never stops or asks why. He doesn't even seem to notice. Afterwards, they cuddle on the couch together, and Mo tells Bone that sometimes in the middle of the night when she can't sleep, she has to check a mirror to see if she's even there. She asks Bone to stay, just for tonight, and he agrees. Moments later, after she falls asleep, he slides away and moves a pillow under her head before sneaking out. Her eyes pop open the second he's gone, and she realizes that their friendship is truly over. The following morning, George finds Bone prepping breakfast on his boat, and he has bad news. The house is burnt to a crisp, meaning either Mo committed suicide in the night, or as Cutter will later suspect, Cord never saw Bone leave the house and set it on fire attempting to kill him after receiving the letter. And it kind of makes sense because he likely set his own car on fire as well right, to, right. to burn the evidence. So seems like his M.O. It's kind of a choose your own adventure, basically. You get to pick which thing happened. <laughs> I mean, because we don't, we never get. A definitive We never answer. get an answer yeah. as to w- what actually happened with the fire. At the morgue later, Bone and Cutter are invited to identify the body. Cutter makes them open the body bag and can't help but touch her charred hands. On their way out of identifying the body, George invites Cutter to stay in his guest house and to come out for a drink, but Cutter turns him down on both counts. He likes to be sad sober. Let's go to the polo club, get a drink. I don't drink. You know, the routine grind uh, drives me to drink. Tragedy I take straight. Bone and Cutter attend a polo game with George, hosted by the suspected murderer, J.J. Cord. Cutter puts one of the polo hats on and suggests this is the funny hat that Cord wore when he bought gasoline the night of Vicky's murder. Here is where Cutter puts forth his theory that Cord is responsible for Moe's death. Cutter starts rattling off an extravagant conspiracy theory about J.J. Cord having watched them all from the beginning. Cutter suspects that they have whole folders with Bone's private information, They know when he was baptized, they know his work history, they know everything he's ever done. Cutter points out that Bone has no choice but to take action because clearly they were after him when they killed Mo, and they won't stop until Bone is dead. Bone admits to Cutter here that things between him and Mo got pretty heavy last night, and she was very depressed when he left, and Cutter is offended on her behalf that Bone would imply that she killed herself just because Bone left her. But also, like... (sighs) I just can't get over what an asshole he was for even leaving. Like, right. I realize yeah. that maybe it saved his life, but he didn't know that. He just told her he'd never leave, and he left, and I right. cannot get over that. Yeah. It's like when Rose was like, I'll never let go. And then she fucking lets go. And then DiCaprio sets the ocean on fire. <laughs> Cutter limps out across the polo field toward J.J. Cord, threatening to kill him for murdering his wife. Bone manages to stop him halfway across the field, and Cutter collapses, sobbing. Bone goes to meet with George in his office again, and George says that Cutter is barricaded in his guest house, mumbling about Cord having murdered someone, and he wants to know what the hell Cutter's talking about. Bone plays dumb. Here we finally get an explanation for why George has been so nice to Cutter. Apparently, when George's mother passed away, Cutter's mom took him in. He feels indebted to her, and he protects her son from himself. At the same time, Cord has also helped George in his life. Apparently, Cord paid George's way through college and got him this job at the marina. George tells Bone that it's up to Bone to take care of Cutter because he's off the deep end. Bone goes to see him at the guest house, and Cutter has maps and battle plans all spread out across a pool table. Yeah, he got a layout uh, of the house, of Cord's house. I mean, He must have gone to City Hall for this or something? Yeah. I don't know where you would get this information. It's not a public building, right? Uh, No, but I think I'll plans like that are registered yeah he tells bone that they have a decent chance at meeting with cord tomorrow turns out george was invited to a party on cord's property and cutter intercepted the invitation he wants bone to be his plus one bone tells cutter that george is really scared about the changes in his behavior and cutter says that the real reason he's scared is because cord also killed george's father and he just keeps adding layers to the conspiracy bone is more speechless every time cutter adds details to this theory According to Cutter, George's father used to own the marina, but then Cord killed his wife, and then when George's father went after Cord, he was beaten into a vegetative state and died. Cutter is suspicious of how Cord took George under his wing in the wake of his parents' deaths. Cord paid for his college, set him up managing the marina, but his father used to own it, so he would have had that job anyway. Again, Cutter invites Bone to the party on Cord's property tomorrow, and we cut to the next morning 
as George is discovering all these battle plans splayed across his guest house pool table. Like, oh shit. <laughs> like he probably came up here looking for the invitation. Mm-hmm. And he's like, this is not good. And he yeah. probably called court immediately from there. Yeah. Well, and I think it's interesting though, because throughout this film, you're, you're, you're kind you're kind of waffling back and forth about how you feel about this conspiracy. Like you're like, oh, he probably did do it. It makes a lot of sense. Ah, oh, but Cutter's like just kind of mm-hmm. a psycho. And then then you add all these extra layers, which again sounds kind of plausible, but he just sounds like a total insane maniac. And yeah. so like at this point I feel like you're certain that he didn't do it because right. he because he's added so much to it even even if he did yeah he just sounds completely unhinged at yeah. this point point. and by, by the way valerie is completely out of the picture at yeah, this point she's gone she, we'll never see her again at the gates to cord's home bone poses as a chauffeur to drive cutter through the gate in george's car using george's invitation back at george's place he finds a note on cutter's dusty car presumably an iou that just says like hey you borrowed can, your car we borrowed your car whoops on their way up the long driveway, Bone asks Cutter one last time if he's sure he wants to go through with this. He reminds Cutter that Mo was very depressed that night, and he asks Cutter what facing off with Cord is going to accomplish in the long run if there's no bringing Mo back. If it's not going to fix your body, like he, he brings everything into it. Cutter gets out of the car halfway up the driveway and wanders through the plants to the party in the yard. Bone parks the car and sneaks around some plants to join the party with Cutter. Now, uh... I noticed something weird, and I don't know if it was if this was just like a fancy '80s car thing. Yeah. But there was a screen on the window, and I don't know if maybe that was a filming thing to keep glare off the window, mm. or or if I didn't see fancy that. cars had actual like screens on the window. Interesting. Um, but there was definitely like some kind of netted material, uh, in the frame on the passenger, uh, dr- sorry, the driver's side window. Huh. I did not notice that. I couldn't get confirmation that like car screens were a thing. Yeah. Other than wind screens. Yes, the wind screen. Once inside the property, Bone crashes directly into Mrs. Cord before introducing himself as Alexander Richard, but you can tell from her eyes that she recognizes him from that French restaurant and she knows exactly what he's doing here. She steps away, presumably to her security team, and points out Bone to one of the men. Bone finds Cutter at the buffet table in the backyard, And he tells Cutter that the Cords know they're here, and he asks for Cutter's gun to prevent anything stupid from happening. I feel like they know they're there because he used a combination of their names stupidly. I mean, she recognized him for the restaurant, but I'm just saying, if you're going to make up a name, make up one that isn't both of your names. Right. But also, (laughs) like like my name's J.J. Cord. Shit. (laughs) (laughs) But they also probably just got a phone call from George saying, hey, my one-eyed friend... And his friend yeah. are coming over, and I think they're going to try and kill your husband. Yeah, remember Lock the crazy ones down. at the restaurant that you overheard? Yeah. Those guys. Look for them. <laughs> I'll fax you a picture right now. Cutter claims the gun isn't loaded. Bone kisses a random party guest to distract an approaching security team, and Cutter barges right into the house. What I really liked about this distraction with the woman is Jeff Bridges is just being really forward. He's like, put your arms around me. He's like, I'm just going to kiss you right now. And she goes, she goes, oh, wow, I don't normally do this kind of thing at a party. And when he runs off, she seems really disappointed. <laughs> yeah. Like, she's like, I I'm would lucky. I would too. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Bridges kissed me and then ran off. I'd be sad. <laughs> I'd be satisfied. That's, that's enough for me. That's more than I deserve. <laughs> Cutter and Bone clumsily sneak around but are immediately cornered by security. Cutter makes a run for it, and Bone throws furniture in their way to slow them down on their way to apprehending him. Cutter races through a crowd in the backyard and eventually ducks into a horse stable. Bone is dragged by the security team to Mr. Cord's office to speak with him directly. Seems like a bad idea to bring him to the room of the person who he's, he's potentially to here to kill. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? And well, it seems like an even worse idea for Cord to suggest that they leave him here alone. With yeah. <laughs> and, and his wife just seems totally like on board. Yeah. Like, She's like, my husband knows his way around a murderer. Cord asks about Bone's friend and mentions that he too is a veteran. He offers to talk to Cutter if Bone thinks that will help. The security team eventually surrounds Cutter and he rides a white horse right out of the stables. They fire guns at him as he races through the party, narrowly past people and pools. Like, It seems like there were any number of ways this could have gone horribly wrong yeah. on set. He guides the horse toward the windows of Cord's office, where it turns at the last second, throwing him through the window and wounding Cutter fatally with shards of the broken glass, because he's just 
stabbed all over with this glass as he comes through it. Bone rushes to cut her on the floor and tells him that he was right, even though we've heard no such confession from Cord. It was him! It was him! Alex dies there on the floor with his gun in his hand, and Bone is now certain that Cord killed Vicky somehow. Here we get the closest thing to a confession that we will get. It was you. What if it were? Bone raises the gun and Cutter's dead hand to aim it at Cord, who puts his glasses on to face death. We cut to black at the sound of the gunshot. The end. Smart, though. Yeah. Because even, you know, the only witness here is Cord. about to die. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, then, and the finger only handprints on the gun are going to be Cutter's. Yeah. And he's dead, too, so you're good. Everything's solid. The book, entitled Cutter and Bone, has a very different ending. For starters... George Swanson has no personal connection to J.J. Cord, whose name is J.J. Wolf in the book, and he's also a poultry magnate in the Ozarks, not an oil man on the West Coast. Hmm. As the book comes to a close, Cutter has a breakdown under the weight of his ever-evolving conspiracy theory and is hospitalized, leaving Bone to confront J.J. himself. And in the novel, Bone grows more certain toward the end that Cutter's theory is correct and eventually confirms it for himself when J.J. and a henchman chase Bone down the road and murder him with a shotgun. Oh. So that's the way the book ends. Hmm. They confirm that he was the killer. And then Bone dies. And Bone dies, yeah. Interesting. I feel like I like the movie better because it was a lot more ambiguous, but we sort of get more satisfaction at the end. Yeah, absolutely. Our director here was Yvonne Passer. I didn't recognize much else from his IMDb, and it looks like he just passed away in January of last year. But together with Milos Forman, he wrote The Fireman's Ball and Loves of a Blonde. Uh, they're both from uh, the Czech Republic. Or Czechoslovakia, I guess, at the time. The writer was Jeffrey Allen Fiskin. He's currently a consulting producer on Amazon Prime's Bosch series. He also wrote The Pursuit of D.B. Cooper, which we're set to review later this season. The music was from Jack Nietzsche. Last year, Nietzsche composed the score for Cruising, and he later scores An Officer and a Gentleman, The Razor's Edge, Starman, Stand By Me, and Mermaids. He won an Oscar for Best Original Song for composing Up Where We Belong for An Officer and a Gentleman. Oh. Love lift us up where we belong. Do, do, do. And we just got tagged for copyright. For there we go. Because my you, voice is so good. It's too perfect. Cinematographer Jordan Cronenweth. He was the DP of Brewster McCloud, which we just watched off the clock. Next year, he DPs Blade Runner. He was the original DP for David Fincher's Alien 3, but he was removed by the studio for taking too long to set up shots. His son, Jeff Cronenweth, was the DP on One Hour Photo and K-19 The Widowmaker and a bunch of Fincher stuff. So maybe he hired him because he had worked with his father in the mm. past. But uh, Jeff was the DP for The Social Network, girl with the dragon tattoo gone girl but most famously for fight club which actually featured jeff's sister jordan's daughter christy cronenweth as the flight attendant who tyler durden passes in the aisle uh, now a question of etiquette as i pass do i give you the ass or the crutch the editor here was caroline biggerstaff she cut the stuntman for us last year for which she was nominated for a pickup that's my award jeff bridges was richard bone we had him last year in Chimino's Heaven's Gate, for which he earned an OVA nomination. <laughs> and I covered his work in American Success Company for a Minnesota earlier this year. He's back later for Tron, Starman, and The Big Lebowski. John Hurd was Alex Cutter. He was Jack Kerouac in Heartbeat last year. We also mentioned before that he was very nearly cast in Willie and Phil, opposite his wife at the time, Margot Kidder. We'll see him next in Cat People next year. <laughs> oh, God. But I'll always jump to Mr. McAllister for him. Yeah, uh, I you know it's funny. I, I usually go to Big. Oh, okay. He's like he, the villain at the yeah the, at the toy place. company. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he also passed away fairly recently. I get like 2017, 2018. Lisa Icorn played Mo. She was Helen Cousins, the wife of Jeff Bridges, in the Vanishing remake. Uh, she's Rachel McAdams' mother in About Time, and she also shows up as Kay in 1980s Why Would I Lie, which I'm covering with a minisode later this year. Anne Dusenberry played Valerie Duran. She was Tina in Jaws 2. We had her as Stevie, the first girlfriend that John Hurt and Nick Nolte share in Heartbeat last year. Her husband is Brad Fidel, who will score Night School and Just Before Dawn for us later this season. Later, he will provide the music for Fright Night, True Lies, Johnny Mnemonic, but he's best known for his score to the Terminator franchise. Stephen Elliott played J.J. Cord. 
He was Burt Johnson in Arthur and Arthur II, the primary antagonist of both films, and a role reprised by Nick Nolte in the Russell Brand remake. He's also Chief Hubbard in Beverly Hills Cop and the police commissioner in Death Wish. Arthur Rosenberg played George Swanson. He's Wes Warnicker in Footloose. He's Roger Breakstone in Cujo and Morton Hull in Being There. Last year we saw him as a hospital administrator with Ball Bricker in Where the Buffalo Roam when Bill Murray's Hunter S. Thompson character had locked himself in a hospital yeah. room with oh, all yeah, the nurses. Yeah. Nina Van Pallant was the woman in the hotel at the very beginning of the film, which is the second time we've had her uh, alongside a gigolo because she was also in American Gigolo. Mm -hmm. She was Eileen Wade in The Long Goodbye. She's in Cloud Dancer, which gets a belated Minnesota on Patreon this season. And she also has a soundtrack credit for vocals on a John Barry song called Do You Know How Christmas Trees Are Grown? from the soundtrack to On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Jack Murdoch played concession owner. He was Hector Ortego in Altered States and Little Melvin in Any Which Way You Can last year. Back later this year as Rhino Wrangler in Honky Tonk Freeway, and he's also John Mooney in Rain Man and Lou in Psycho 3. Julia Duffy played Young Girl. She was Mole in Battle Beyond the Stars last year. She's upper-class maid Stephanie Vanderkellen in 163 episodes of New Heart. And she was Allison Sugarbaker on Designing Women. Billy Drago played the vomiting garbage man. Yeah. yeah you barely see him in there. But uh, this is his second credit for us after Windwalker. He was Blackhand Kelly in Tremors 4. He was Mickey in Invasion USA, but our favorite was John Bly from Briscoe County Jr. Jonathan Terry played the police captain. He was Colonel Glover in Return of the Living Dead 1 and 2. He's also Starker in Halloween 3. And he's back later in 1981 to play Akron Doctor in All the Marbles. Ted White was guard number one. He showed up in Oh God Book 2 last year as a motorcycle cop. And he's back this year in Demonoid, Going Ape, The Legend of the Lone Ranger, and History of the World Part 1. He was also a guard in Tron, and he's uncredited as Jason in Friday the 13th, The Final Chapter, which is obviously his IMDb photo. It's him in the mask. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming he's just in some scenes since he's uncredited. You would think the person wearing the hockey mask would be credited for the whole movie. I like this film a lot. Yeah, I did. I think it improved on the source material, if that's how the book ends. Yeah. Um, I also uh, read that the producers were worried that it was too similar to uh, Easy Rider, the way that it was written before, that people would, since it, it would have come out, you know, recently enough that people would remember it well and be like, this seems like the way that other movie ended. Uh, I, 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 I disagree. I mean, they, I mean, they, I mean spoiler kill, for people who haven't seen Easy Rider. But also that, that the way that they die in the book would have been the same as the way that they die in that movie. Mm. Um, it's basically the same scene playing out over again. I understand why they wanted to avoid it. Uh, but I think what they ended up with was better. Yeah. I, I do think that in this version of the story, I lean more towards Cutter is crazy than, than I do in that version? other thing. Yeah. yeah. Like maybe maybe he did kill this girl. I believe that it's possible that he killed Vicky. But right. the whole like, oh, it's a George, massive conspiracy. Yeah, he George's, killed George's parents yeah. and yeah. he did this other thing and he yeah. and he burned down our house and he has, you know, he's keeping tabs on us and everything we do. Yeah. I, I don't believe that stuff because it's presented to me as the ramblings of a madman and not. Right, but, but, there's, but there's enough there that you could be like, it could be true. Yeah, it could be. But it also, he could be making all of this up. Because we, we don't actually see him talking to any of these witnesses. Yeah. He just disappears and then he comes back drunk crashing into things. Mm -hmm. And he says, I talked to some people and they said he was at this place and he did this thing. I mean, really the only hard evidence we have is the body and the article about his, his car being on fire. Yeah. But. Well, I mean, and the fact that Bone thought it kind of looked like that guy. Yeah, but that's weird too because we see basically what Bone sees. And yeah. he doesn't resemble in that alleyway at all what he looks like on this horse yeah i mean you're in two different locations at two different times a day and you know two different outfits like i feel like one of the things that could have helped to solidify this thing was uh, uh bone got a good look at the headlights and the tail lights and if 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 cutter had said do these tail lights look like the ones that you saw uh you know, like, like I, match the type of car. Yeah, like because yeah. it, it had pretty unique looking taillights. Yeah, and and you know he 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 tries to th like get Bone to say something like like it was a big car like like a Cadillac. It's like yeah, and it's like like I don't know. And it's like well, 
you're implying that that then that JJ Core drove a Cadillac, and that's what you're trying to get him to say. Yeah. Um, but I I feel like you could have you could have gotten some evidence there. Yeah. In, instead in, of leading the witness with your yeah exactly yeah. That, that 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 leads more to your point, Patrick, that he's trying to get Bone to say these certain things. Yeah, because he wants more information mm-hmm. to confirm his theory. But yeah, I still like the movie. I am not in love with John Hurd's performance as much as most people are. I, oh, people are in love with that? Yes. Oh. Okay. I mean, critically, that's like the thing that the takeaway from this movie was that John Hurd is underappreciated and that he did a phenomenal job. Oh, okay. Interesting. Because I, I think I felt similar to you. It feels super over the top to me. I, I, It's not even just that it's over the top. It just feels forced. It feels like it's not a genuine... Like weirdness, especially when the part the part that kind of pushed me over the edge is when he's reeling back to hit the car the second time out in front of the house, and he's like doing this weird forced laughter that it's just he, annoying. He me. also has a a kind of funny like accent that he's doing throughout this whole film. Like he's yeah. doing something with his voice, and granted, we all know what he sounds like normally, so maybe that is is throwing me off you know like it, it could be part of it you know when people do an accent that you're not used to it's mm-hmm. not you but know. i think even if richard dreyfus tried to gruff up his voice to play this character that i w- i would believe that more than i do with I, john Hurd. yeah here. i don't yeah i'm not sure what it is about his performance well, but i was well, not too keen either well richard dreyfus also has a very infectious fake laugh that's true. I, I feel like whenever <laughs> Richard Dreyfuss has to fake laugh in a film, it's like, I really believe that he's laughing because yeah. I think he's got a really good laugh. Because that's how he fake laughs. Yeah. Is that he, just, he just actually laughs. Um, but I actually liked John Hurd's performance in this. Uh, so I'm sorry that I'm in the I'm in the opposite camp. I liked uh, him in Heartbeat last year, and I, I thought that was a that was a totally believable performance from beginning I, to end. I, I think it's it for me it it was uh a little hard to take the seriously because it almost felt like he he's so uh with, with, with the one eye the one arm the one leg he he seems like such a caricature of a character yeah. right yeah um and that's what i struggled with it's like look this guy is so extreme and i'm not saying that there's not people with disabilities this way um it just seems like he is so extreme in every aspect that that i i find it hard to believe that he's friends with anybody and that his wife would continue to stand by him as long as she did. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we don't know how he started either. Mm-hmm. Like, he could have been an eccentric, awful person to begin with. But but everything, everyone, but like, like he, he damages stuff at the bar and all the bartender says, that's going on your tab, Cutter. Like, like this happens every week. Yeah, and Cutter obviously doesn't have a job. Yeah. So it's not like his tab is ever going to get covered. Yeah, and so it seems like everyone puts up with him. And, and I guess he, there's a history, but I don't know what it is. Yeah. Right. Um, and... The and closest we get was that the interview that I listened to with John Hurd, where he was just saying that in his mind, he and Mo had been boyfriend and girlfriend since they were kids, basically. Mm. Um, and that's part of why they stayed together for as long as they did. But, and Bone was also like their childhood Third companion. wheel, yeah. 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 But that one of them went off to college and one of them went off to the war. Mm-hmm. And then they came back different people, but also they're not starkly different. Yeah, because because John Hurt's character seems very intelligent and well read and well spoken, mm-hmm. uh, and so trying to play them off as like you went to college and I went to war, you, you it's like you seem like you went to college and to war. <laughs> yeah, I went to the College of Hard Knocks. I don't really understand George protecting or helping cutter like i get his relationship with bone and you know being taken in by no that was cutter's mom oh wait so why then why is he so nice to bone (laughs) bone Bone doesn't need that much cutter's the one who needs help all the time i guess okay so because bone when he needs a car he'll just steal one from his best friend he doesn't i mean bother george to come pick him up but george is george is still helpful to and, and and very lenient on the, uh, the shenanigans that Bone is part of mm-hmm. as yeah, well. That's true. Even though, I mean, I guess he's perhaps a very good salesman. Because yeah, I was going to say tactics. it's his, yeah. he's a star employee. So and, and and he's doing things that George can't do for the business. <laughs> yeah, that's true. No offense, George. I'm just saying he's a married man. Oh sure, yeah, yeah that yeah. too. <laughs> bone can bone is what we're saying. Yeah. Thumbs up. This is a thumbs up for me, for sure. Yeah, I'll give it a thumbs up. Yep, it's a thumbs up from me. 
Um, Letterboxd, what are we thinking? I have it at number seven out of 31 for the year. Uh, It's pretty good. Not the best, uh, but not bad. It's uh, above The Incredible Shrinking Woman, but below American Pop. Uh, I have it at number three. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, this is this one's pretty high up for me. I was really engaged by this movie. Um, this puts it just below Dogs of War, but above Incredible Shrinking Woman. I have this in fifth place, uh, which is just under My Bloody Valentine and just above American Pop. I also want to mention, we didn't touch on it before, that the soundtrack for this film is incredible. And it's really strange. Yeah, it's very like surrealist, but really atmospheric. It, it makes you, it feels very dingy somehow. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it does a lot of like like quivering off key, like yeah. the instruments. I don't know how you do that effect, or even what instrument it was. I don't know how to play an instrument. <laughs> 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 but uh, but Jack Nietzsche knows, and he pulled it off. But I, I really like the score. You know, Nietzsche says, "Out of chaos comes order." Oh, blow it out your ass, Howard. <laughs> <laughs> what is that from? Blazing Saddles. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I think that's everything for Cutter's Way. If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we're Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd, where, as I said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. We also have a Discord now. Join the 24-7 movie chat and share your thoughts on episodes past, present, and future at vintagevideopodcast.com slash discord. And if you're listening on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe. Click the subscribe button. I don't know where it is. I'm not that good at YouTube yet. <laughs> He's pointing at it right now. Right over there. See? This isn't a video podcast. For sure. <laughs> no, it's like helping your parents with technology. Pu- click this one. No, <laughs> not no, that. No, that. not the trash can. Over ah. there. Oh, man. You just threw our podcast away. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Omen 3, The Final Conflict, which IMDb describes like so. The now adult Antichrist plots to eliminate his future divine opponent while a cabal of monks plot to stop him. We leave you now with the trailer for Omen 3, The Final Conflict. In 1976, the birth of evil was foretold in the omen. In 1978, a terrifying prophecy was fulfilled in Damien Omen 2. And now, you will witness the ultimate challenge to the future of mankind as the trinity of living terror is completed. In the final conflict. Yes, Mr. President. I just appointed Mr. Damien Thorne as our new ambassador to the court of St. James. Damien Thorne is 32. Attractive, brilliant, charismatic. To the modern world, he brings a purpose, a vision, a destiny. He's one step away from the most important position on Earth. Disciples of the Watch, I stand before you in the name of the one who is cast out from heaven but it's alive in me the power of evil is no longer in the hands of a child Heed the warning. Prepare for the final conflict, the concluding chapter of the Omen Trilogy.